like Rise of the Triad is the type of game that feels like the end result of a bunch of developers being in a confined space, getting loaded and thinking up the weirdest possible shit to whack into one single game. Released in 1995, developed by Apogee Software and running on the then dated Wolfenstein engine. Initially planned as a sequel to Wolfenstein 3D, it ended up being something else entirely. The best way to summarize it is a maze-like first-person shooter laced with angel dust. When selecting a new game, you're given the option to play as one of five members of a special forces team named Hunt, short for High Risk United Nations Task Force. Hunt is sent to a mysterious island to investigate a dangerous cult, before their boat is destroyed and their only way out is in. The concept is that different characters have different stats like speed and health, but overall it doesn't have any bearing on how the story pans out. It does for the most part play out like any other shooting game you're likely to see from the same era. Using the mouse and keyboard to move, you'll navigate large levels full of multiple enemy types as you search for keys to progress through locked doors until an exit is found. Rise of the Triad is quite a large game, offering up four different themed episodes with seven or eight levels each. Each episode features a different area of the island and is finished off with a unique boss fight. The levels can be really confusing at times and can take considerable time and patience to complete. The game may run on the Wolfenstein engine, but you'd hardly know it, and they pack loads of features into the engine like elevators, breakable windows, jump pads, and touch plates. Jump pads function like how they sound, launching you high into the air to collect items or just to pass otherwise dead ends, whilst touch plates are near invisible tiles that, when walked over, open up passageways and other locked areas. On top of that, you've also got to avoid all manner of traps and hazards in the game's various levels from fireballs shooting out of the walls to spinning blades or just large pillars that move around the environment, crushing everything they touch. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. Then you've got a bunch of power-ups like God Mode and Dog Mode, which, well, turns you into a dog. It also has a soundtrack created by two of the best gaming composers of the 90s, Bobby Prince and Lee Jackson. I couldn't say a bad word about these guys or the soundtrack if I tried. The sound effects are a bit hit and miss, and some of them sound like they've even been made with someone's mouth, but all things considered, it gets the job done. For its time, Rise of the Triad had some clever enemies that really kept you on your toes. Certain enemies would play dead until you got close or turned your back to them. Other enemies could hurl nets at you, restricting your movement until you wiggled free. And the more dangerous enemy types encountered in later episodes could throw grenades and even roll sideways to avoid gunfire. <laughs> In the last episode, you'll even take on creepy-looking cultists, decked out in robes who chant ominously and hurl explosive magic at you. You can't say it isn't original. Another feature that set the game apart was its weapon system. You start off with a pistol, which you can also dual wield, and then soon after that you get a machine gun. These guns all have infinite ammo, which is handy, because you'll need to fall back on them frequently. Aside from that, you also get a fourth weapon slot for explosive weapons like bazookas and heat-seeking missiles. Explosive weapons had limited ammo, and you were only permitted to carry one at a time. Running over another weapon would cause you to drop the one you currently had, replacing it. And it should be said that some of these explosive weapons, whilst not entirely original, are damn fun to use. They do have something of a learning curve as well, as they could quite often cause some hefty splash damage if you're not careful. The standouts are definitely the firewall, which shoots out an impenetrable wall of fire at enemies, charring them to the bone. And the firebomb an utterly devastating weapon that detonates in a large X formation, blowing everything to shit unlucky enough to be in its range. In the last few levels, you'll also get your hands on some magical weapons like the Dark Staff and the Excalibat, which can be used to give enemies in a single hit or shoot out an arc of exploding baseballs. Killing an enemy with any of these weapons would often send eyeballs and blood spatters flying across the screen, kind of adding to the game's tongue-in-cheek tone. Rise of the Triad's biggest strengths is also one of its biggest detriments, and that's the level design. One of the game's claim to fame at the time was that it had levels up to 40 or 50 square meters in size. Now, I can appreciate that from a technical perspective, but it doesn't translate so well into gameplay. It means you'll be doing a lot of key hunting, as almost every single level is full of multiple locked doors, which require one of up to four different key types to unlock. Touch plates, as I mentioned earlier, often open up passageways and hidden doors, but these are often required to finish certain levels, and that can result in a lot of backtracking. 
keys are often hidden in the most difficult and hard to reach places, often far away from the door they're actually meant for. I've never been too fond of these older type of maze style games and Rise of the Triad is definitely one of the worst of its kind in that regard. Then there's some small problems like the auto aim not working at certain times and the way enemies can whittle away at your health from the other side of the level. But I think the game's biggest problem is that it just had the misfortune of being released after Doom, a problem that plagued many shooting games at the time and it just looks prehistoric in comparison. Aside from the retail version, there was also a so-called extreme version of the game released, which featured another four episodes, each with seven or eight levels. And aside from that, you've also got the shareware version, which once again features eight original levels. All in all, that's a hell of a lot of stuff to get through, and it's pretty good bang for the buck if you can actually get into the game in the first place, obviously. It's not quite a classic in the same vein as Doom, but it is still a quirky title from a period in the 90s when you really had to go searching to find a bad shooting game. The Apogee throwback on Steam is probably the best version of the game out there at the moment, and you also get the Blakestone series thrown in for free. 